Hi, I'm Patrick. Welcome back to ICIP, also known as something I've really liked and enjoyed the past couple of months. So today we've reached the official end of the course. This is lecture number five in the UN, and that means we are done with the substantial parts. We've shown you how international cooperation can work all the way from the regional to the global level in a number of different organizations, and hopefully we've given you a little bit of a theoretical tool set that helps you better understand how this particular, how these particular types of cooperation work. Now, the last lecture on the UN is something a tiny bit different because I am not going to be talking about something substantive that the UN does, like peacekeeping or development, but rather take a look at the organization itself because much of the discussion around the UN in the past 76 years, including even our live streams, has been around whether the UN is still fit for purpose and whether the UN can change and if it should change, how should it change? So that's what we'll talk a, a, a lot about today. We'll take a closer look at different reform models, where they've gone, how the UN has changed over time. And for most of that, I will throw it to past Patrick to give you an overview of what's there. And I will come in at the end to give you a little bit of my view of where this can go and maybe what we should focus on when we discuss UN reform. So, um, past Patrick, where does all this fit into sort of the larger course themes or the lectures on the UN? So we've heard previously on the course that the UN is tasked with a great many things. Uh, not only does it have to take care of peace and security, it also has increasingly been charged with taking care of human rights around the world, with uh, fostering development, and with everything from environmental degradation to health. We've also heard, of course, that one of the um, problems in this isn't just the UN's own complex structure, but of course the complex nature of these problems themselves, and oftentimes these problems are interconnected. It's hard to imagine how you can provide development, for example, without making at least an, in uh, an impact on uh, the environment. It's hard to understand how you can protect human rights without uh, also thinking about protecting security worldwide. And so these uh, interconnected problems have also uh, meant that the UN itself, the UN's mission, has uh, undergone changes and the UN's structure, well, it's proliferated, but it hasn't really undergone very many fundamental changes in a constitutional sense. I'll talk about what I mean by that in a second. So um, we see an increasing number of bodies, agencies, institutions that all report to the UN or are the UN's um, uh, sub-organs. And we've also heard at a number of different places that there was a certain tension inherent in the UN. Uh, and those tensions kind of fall along several different dimensions. There is a tension between sort of fundamental underlying values so, um, for example, there is a tension between the idea that the UN should safeguard sovereignty, so the non-interference in domestic affairs, but also we've learned that, of course, interventions sometimes are a necessary means to an end. Um, and the idea whether uh, the discussion on whether the UN is primarily driven by self-interested states or the UN is an institution driven by notions of solidarity is unresolved to this day. There are also tensions between specific groups of member states. We used to have an East-West tension during the Cold War that's influenced a lot of the discussions for the first few decades of the UN. Nowadays, that division seems to more be to, uh, between the Global North and the Global South, or if you want to frame it a different way, between developed and developing countries that not only sometimes have radically different visions of what the UN is supposed to be, but even radically different vision, visions of how the world is supposed to look like. We've also heard that there is a tension between structures and processes. So there is a tension always in the UN between the fact that the UN doesn't have enough resources at its disposal to probably uh, fulfill all the things it's been tasked with, but that the UN also undergoes mission creep. So the, in, in other words, the UN is told to do ever more things with the same or reduced resources. And we've also heard that already there is a uh, few issue areas, both in terms of human rights and in development, and there's a few others too, where different organs and bodies of the UN are competing with each other, not only for influence, but sometimes even for resources. 
And most fundamentally, maybe we've heard that there's a certain tension between theory and practice. So the idea of this global institution and the idea of institutional uh, of global cooperation is um, certainly a good one, I would argue, but it's been one that it has been quite hard to put into practice sometimes. So we essentially see a uh, a tension between slow processes, which is what the institution was originally set up to do, but problems becoming ever more urgent, uh, which is a, a challenge. Still though, and that's a question I always like asking when it comes to uh, thinking about the UN, isn't it still our best hope? Isn't it still the best model so far we've come up with in terms of fostering international cooperation and really uh, tackling global international problems? Now, um, when you talk about the future of the UN, you inevitably come to UN reform. And you see very quickly that UN reform has been a thing almost since the UN itself was founded. Um, as the Global Policy Forum pointed out in 2014, UN reform is endlessly discussed. Foundations, think tanks, blue ribbon commissions regularly call for renovation. Secretary generals trumpet their own reform initiatives, NGOs make proposals, and from Washington, meaning the US, come sober warnings that the UN must reform or die. So the idea here is that uh, UN reform has become a bit of a meme. It's become a bit of a sort of a recurring like segment on each year's uh, uh, kind of uh, UN sitcom, like, oh, okay, we'll have another UN proposal, uh, another reform proposal uh, this year. So it's not something that's a new development. It's been around for a long time and many different aspects of how to reform the UN as an organization have been discussed for decades, oftentimes. I think a useful tool though to understand what is being discussed is to create a typology of um, which scope these, these proposed UN reforms have. And this is also uh, explained in slightly greater detail in the course reading um, for this week or for the specific lecture. And um, if you think about sort of a magnitude, sort of um, reforms that are fairly small, but probably pretty easy to implement to reforms that are fairly large and therefore hard to implement, you move from left to right. So first you have proposals for UN reform that basically just don't want to change anything fundamentally about the institution, they just want to increase its efficiency. They just, they just want to make sure that the UN can do its job a little better. So the aim here is to create greater capabilities and greater effectiveness in the UN's central responsibilities. So that can be peace and security, that could be development or other things. Um, examples for these types of reforms are uh, proposals to uh, rationalize the administrative body, you know, like hire fewer people, fire a few people. John Bolton, the former U.S. Uh, permanent representative to the U.N., once famously said that if the U.N. high rise in New York just uh, lost its top 10 stories, nothing much of value would be lost. So maybe the U.N. system is just too big and too unwieldy. So streamlining processes, streamlining departments, could be one of these efforts. Processes, of course, in this context also means streamlining the often very complex bureaucratic, maybe over-engineered processes at the UN itself. The fact that some mid-level appointments in some organizations have to be uh, approved by 193 member states might not be the best way to set things up or to reform the UN's finances. So giving it more or less money, moving money around, giving money out with conditions and so on. The magnitude of all these reforms tends to be quite low. So they're, they, they don't change anything fundamentally about the UN. And therefore normally these have a fairly good chance of passing when they're being proposed. Doesn't mean it's automatic of course, but they're certainly the most likely to pass of all the reforms that we'll discuss. In the medium category, we have institutional reforms. So they change something about the UN as an institution. They go beyond just increasing efficiency and effectiveness. So any types of institutional remodelings and adjustments uh, to changing environments fall into this category. And examples for that are uh, reforming the Security Council, reforming ECOSOC. We talked in the last lecture about how ECOSOC was considered to be the, le the UN's least powerful deliberative body. Um, maybe changes to the Human Rights Council or making the Human Rights Commission into the Human Rights Council, elevating the Human Rights Council to a principal organ, 
next to the Security Council, the GA and the ECOSOC, for example. So these are things that essentially move building blocks around in, st in the institutional design of the UN. So they go beyond increasing efficiency, but they stop short of fundamentally changing the institution because after all, for example, these organs are still the same. They might get empowered or their powers might get reduced. They might get moved around, but that doesn't really change things fundamentally. And then lastly, we have a category that is that oftentimes people think that that's the only thing that's being discussed in regards to the UN. And those are fundamental changes. So are we thinking about sort of constitutional realignments of the institution. So should we really rethink the core founding uh, principles and aims of uh, the UN itself? Um, and examples for this are things that now we as IR scholars know have very little chance of passing when they're being proposed. So making the UN into a proper supranational institution, kind of like the EU maybe, that actually has some decision-making power and to which states are legally bound. Um, the establishment of an effective responsibility to protect, right? An automatic uh, sort of sense of uh, intervention when certain human rights violations are being committed or the idea to create a multinational army at the international level that then can intervene in, in conflicts or preserve peace. Uh, this is, of course, a very fundamental rethinking of the UN as an institution, and therefore that tends to have a low probability of passing whenever it's being proposed. Doesn't mean people aren't proposing it. There's tons of proposals that go are going this direction. Their chances are just lower. Now, there is, uh, as Weiss uh, identified, four roadblocks to the UN uh, and to UN reform. And these always tend to be the same roadblocks or have been the same roadblocks for a very long time. So the first is still that many at the UN consider state sovereignty to be sacrosanct. So you can't touch state sovereignty. The core value that state sovereignty has to be preserved and that the UN needs to have a policy of non-interference in domestic affairs is one that is very hard to overcome at the UN, not just with the permanent veto powers, but also with many other states. So there is a gap here because of this uh, safeguarding of state sovereignty between problems that the UN is being charged with and its capacity to actually attack these problems. If we hold state sovereignty to be... Uh, uh, to, to having having to be intact above everything, then it also means, for example, that our options in terms of interventions against human rights violations are limited. Because after all, either there is state sovereignty or there is not. Uh, and curtailing state sovereignty is always a very difficult uh, proposal at the UN. Now, the second thing that Weiss identifies is something that he calls process trumps results. So there is sometimes a, an idea at the UN that a slow and steady progress can be made towards certain solutions. And that does tend to lead to the um, perception that if you get the process and if you get the consultations right along this process, and then the outcomes inevitably must be right too. So the idea here is that you have a constellation in which the people that are working for the organization, and that includes the diplomats that are in UN, in the at the UN, often are more preoccupied with the process and the negotiations rather than necessarily the outcomes, and that leads to situations where you have you know, 17 subcommittees that are all investigating their own thing that dutifully present a report every year that five people around the world read. And then that whole thing goes on for 12 years and that what comes out is a recommendation to the GA, which the GA might not pick up. And even if it picks it up, then that is being passed as a resolution that is non-binding. So what's even the point? So the idea here is that we need to make sure that the process at least matches the results so that the results are equally important as the process. The third point is there is a certain degree of north-south theater, as Weiss calls it nowadays at the UN. This is kind of mirrors the situation during the Cold War where you had an east-west theater. So in other words, the UN is being used as a stage to really um, call out those that aren't in your camp necessarily to um, shame and possibly humiliate those that are on the other side. 
And um, without necessarily having, having to take a side here, that also means that oftentimes things are being deadlocked because while people could be talking about specific challenges and about specific problems, oftentimes the discussion kind of rolls around to the bigger issue, say, for example, of the global north versus the global south, and that then tends to paralyze further discussions. And of course, this hasn't just been a uh, this is a, a longer standing issue, at least for the past 20 years or so, but it certainly has gotten worse with the advent of certain populist leaders all around the world. This is everything from Chavez to Trump to Bolsonaro to Duterte and so on that are often that have quite often used the UN as a stage for their own political presentation and for the calling out of perceived enemies. Um, the fourth point is turf battles and decentralization. I still maintain that the best way to understand the UN is to just imagine it as a giant bureaucracy. It is primarily a bureaucracy and that's how it operates. It might be staffed by very idealistic people that, you know, uh, want to think long term and want to, um, uh, want to do good things, but it's still primarily a bureaucracy with all the drawbacks that that entails. So uh, one memorable way to think about the UN uh, that one expert once proposed was to think about the UN as less of a system and more of a family uh, with all the dysfunctionality that that comes with. Um, so most often this stems from overlapping jurisdictions, so different um, organizations, different bodies, different institutions are essentially doing the same thing and they want to guard their turf. They don't want to give any... Um, decision-making power or agenda setting power away so that leads you to you know having 17 different uh body 17 is a fantasy number but like having a, a large number of bodies involved in protecting human rights and having 36 organizations all somehow involved in development and um because decision making and funding is often highly decentralized so all of these institutions have their own little budgets that they jealously guard that just leads to a lot of redundancies a lot of lost uh, efficiency uh, in the system and reforming all of these things as vice points out reforming all of these things is not an apolitical process because none of these questions have easy answers they often stem from political um factors so they're driven by political factors so eliminating these problems cannot be an apolitical process so um oftentimes the way that un reform is set up is really just a mirror of global power politics um, with the same uh, countries in the same camps on a variety of different issues now um there have been a number of major reform initiatives in the past, and we're just going to run through a couple of them uh, in the next few minutes. So the first kind of really, really big push for UN reform, um, or at least the, the first one I'll, I'll talk about, came uh, during the time of the millennium. We already heard that the Millennium Development Goals were the part of this push. Um, by the UN. In 2005, there was a world summit that came around uh, that, by the way, also talked about the responsibility to protect, if you go back to lectures. And uh, it was also the 60th anniversary of the UN. So everyone kind of decided that maybe this was the right moment in time to give both the UN and its charter an overhaul. And then Secretary General Kofi Annan prepared a report of course, everything has to work through reports at the UN that was called Enlarger Freedom that had a number of more or less far ranging suggestions for how the UN could change. It first um, sort of structured the UN's primary strategic goals and it stru uh, structured them around the ideas of different types of freedoms. This freedom from want was the idea of sustainable development. Freedom from fear was the idea to provide global security, for example. Freedom to live in dignity was the idea of protecting human rights. And um, some of the institutional uh, suggestions that the report made was, for example, abolishing the trusteeship council. If you go back to uh, lecture number one on the UN, I told you that that was the body that oversaw post-colonialism and the letting go into independence of former colonial territories. That wasn't the thing anymore. It was still a primary organ. What the hell was that even doing in the charter if it wasn't meeting and it wasn't doing anything? And the same goes for a few other institutional quirks, such as the military staff committee that was originally designed to kind of move towards this idea of a UN army, maybe, or a UN military staff, and that really didn't go anywhere. 
And there's a few other quirks in there, such as the enemy clause, which you can read up on yourself. Um, it was suggested that both the GA and the and ECOSOC should undergo a revitalization, both, both in terms of uh, their mission, what they could discuss, but also in terms of their, their working methods and the, the way that they were, their processes were set up. And the report also suggested to move away from the Human Rights Committee to a Human Rights Council uh, structured in a similar way to the Security Council and the Economic and Social Council. And crucially, it also made a few suggestions for reform of the Security Council, and that is really the crown jewel in reforming the UN. Uh, and the report came up with two things that are called models A and B. We'll talk about that in a slide. Now, oftentimes when you discuss the UN and when you discuss UN reform, it takes about like five and a half minutes max, even with very smart people, until the discussion kind of collapses inward and you always end up at the same point, and that is Security Council reform. So it's important to understand, of course, that there is a whole host of things that you could do to reform the UN that don't necessarily have to do with reforming the Security Council, but at least many people think that unless you reform the Security Council, what are you even doing in terms of UN reform? Um, Security Council reform actually can be sort of understood as tackling at least three different issues with the Security Council. We've talked about this in the lectures and we've talked about these in the live stream too, just to take this apart a little bit. There's one um, group of people that say that the main, one of the big problems with the Security Council is its lack of transparency and its intransparent working methods. So the sheer fact that uh, negotiations tend to happen behind the scenes and out of the public eye, which also means out, out of the eye of the states that aren't a part of the Security Council. Let's remember that the Security Council in its current shape only has 8% of all UN members as, um, as members. <laughs> 8% of UN member. So 8% of UN member states are also members of the Security Council. So 92% of countries are not in the room. Um, that leads us to our next point, which is membership. So is the Security Council large enough? Should it enlarge itself? If so, by how much? And who should get these new seats? And should these new seats be permanent seats? Or should they be non-permanent seats? And then lastly, uh, the veto, of course. Um, the fact that you sit in the Security Council doesn't mean you automatically get a veto, but we also know that the veto power itself is a remnant of a conflict that was concluded 75 years ago. The victorious powers of World War II are still the ones that hold all the cards in the Security Council, and that, um, at least many people argue, is not a uh, system that is set up to succeed nowadays, and especially not to get buy-in from everyone else in the world. I do want to say, though, that while Security Council reform is important, and we will discuss it on the next slide, does it really need to be addressed or even solved to allow other reforms? I would suggest it does not. You might disagree. I think you can do lots of things to make the UN better, more efficient, more effective, and more inclusive without even touching the Security Council reform. On the other hand, it's always difficult when you suggest certain reforms and your discussion partner inevitably will come back to the point of, well, that's all nice, but as long as the Security Council looks the way it does, as long as that's the only institution that can make binding decisions in the UN, all of these other reforms are really just um, putting a fresh coat of paint on the house. That doesn't change anything fundamentally. Now, Security Council reform is a fascinating topic, and uh, strap in, because on this slide I had to manually make like a hundred of these little dots. So we'll run through a couple of suggestions for Security Council reform. Now we know, of course, that at the moment we have uh, five permanent members and 10 temporary members. So uh, countries are elected to the Security Council as temporary members. They're in there for a few years and then they rotate out again. So what you see here is in red, you have permanent members. In blue, you have non-permanent members. The squares are veto powers and the round shapes are non-veto powers. So we have a couple of different models on how this UN, uh, how this body could be uh, changed. At the moment, it's 15 members. In the report in Larger Freedom that I just talked about by Kofi Annan, two different models were proposed to change the UN Security Council. Uh, what was called Model A was a suggestion to add six permanent members, 
but ones that didn't have a veto. That's why they're red, but not squares. And to also add three non-permanent uh, member states. So to bring it up to a total of 24. While that's not, that doesn't mean that suddenly half the UN is sitting in the Security Council, it would certainly increase representation. And depending on who would get the uh, new permanent seats, you could certainly argue that it would be a wider representation of the world if not just Western states were, were to receive those uh, permanent seats. Model B was sort of along the same lines, but it didn't suggest adding any new permanent members, It, but it, it did suggest adding eight new seats that uh, were uh, for a specific length of time, four years, and that could be renewed. Normally what happens is once you've had your turn in the Security Council, you have to get out of it before you can get back elected back in, and that can't be back-to-back -back terms. These new seats that were created here uh, were designed to solve this. Uh, so eight new um, renewable seats for uh, other countries. Um, and so essentially this would create a third category between permanent members and temporary members in it would be renewable members essentially. Now, there's a couple of other suggestions, all of which are really interesting. Now, there's the G4 group, uh, and the G4 countries are Brazil, Germany, India, and Japan. Now, the G4's proposal is interesting because the G4 proposal says, A, there should be six new permanent members. And by the way, we four countries that have suggested this uh, should each get one of these new permanent seats. The idea is that uh, Germany and Japan, for example, are major industrial powers, major contribu contributors to the UN budget, um, but that are not big military powers. So therefore they should get a permanent seat here, even though they don't suggest giving those seats a veto. And then you have India and Brazil as uh, representatives of the developing world. The G4, interestingly enough, suggests that actually there should be not just four new permanent seats, but six, and that two of those six seats should go to Africa. It wasn't specified which African countries should get those. Uh, that was supposed to be decided by the African group itself. And they also suggested adding four new um, non-permanent members for a total of 25 members of the Security Council, so up by 10. There is a uh, UFC model, and that's not the people that beat each other. Um, it's UFC, meaning uniting for consensus, which is a group that really doesn't like the G4 proposal. So these are uh, states like South Korea, Canada, Spain, Italy, Argentina, and Pakistan. So a pretty varied group here. And what unites them is that they really don't like the G4 proposal and the G4 countries getting permanent seats. They essentially have the most uh, wide-ranging change proposal in that they want to do away with the veto. Um, so they want to take the veto power away from the uh, uh, permanent members and they would include a full 10 new members in terms of the non-permanent seats. So this would bring the total up to 25 members but uh, without a veto and without new permanent members that would be given to specific countries such as the ones uh, suggested by the G4. And this is a fairly large group, by the way. This is not just those six countries. It's a fairly large group that uh, collects uh, member states from all around the world. You have an African group model, and the African group model, maybe not that surprisingly, suggests that first two new permanent veto-empowered seats should be added for African states. Now, mind you, the African group probably would like to do away with the veto, but if permanent seats were to be added, then those should also get the veto unless everyone does, does away with the veto. So two new permanent seats for African countries, five new uh, temporary seats that are reserved for African countries and four additional ones. Um, so uh, I should have done the math here before, 19, 21, 26 countries. So now you have 26 member states in this proposal. You have the L69 um, a proposal, and that is a proposal that comes from a, a number of uh, developing countries all around the world that aren't sort of a part of the other groups here that are suggesting things. They make an interesting proposal, much like the African group, they would prefer for the veto to go away. But if the veto were to stay, then they propose six new permanent veto-empowered seats. And these should each come from one of the world regions. And they also suggest adding six per temporary new members that are also distributed by the UN's world region system. 
So an interesting proposal because it doesn't really have any specific countries in mind at that point. It just says that the Security Council as a whole needs to be more inclusive of different world regions and countries need to get in there both permanently and temporarily that represent a wider spectrum of the UN member states. And then finally, we have proposals like proposals like the one from the Arab group, Arab group that really just wants to add one permanent member state uh, to the Security Council. That member state should be from the Arab world, not super surprising. Uh, and they also are strongly against retaining veto power, so they want to do away with the veto. So you see already that there's a there's a multitude of reform proposals and there's still others that are floating around that are slight variation on this. So we have everything from the status quo with 15 members to 26 members. We have everything from uh, five permanent members all the way up to 11 uh, with or without veto powers. So it's it's a it's a ridiculous mess. Um, and the multitude of proposals is one of the reasons why reform has been so difficult. And this is really considered sort of the Gordian knot. Like if we could ever solve Security Council reform, then we can probably solve almost any other problem. The issue, the wider issue that the reduction of the reform discussion to Security Council reform has is that um, these frozen kind of power dynamics in this discussion s often spill over into the other reform debates. So once you've drawn these battle lines in terms of which countries are for which proposals, oftentimes these countries will also find themselves along these battle lines in other uh, reform discussions. And that might not be the most fruitful way forward. So very hard to achieve consensus here. It hasn't happened, obviously, because the Security Council is still unchanged. And some of these proposals have been floating around for close to 15 years now, if not longer. Now, the one question I would ask maybe um, at the bottom here is, sometimes the question gets forgotten of why we're reforming the Security Council in the first place. Why are we so focused on this, right? And I think that oftentimes the reform proposals aren't really giving a lot of credence to that. The idea is just, oh, you know, let's add more members. Let's make this more representative. But of course, that doesn't guarantee any more effectiveness or efficiency. If you add new veto powers, if anything, that would just slow the process down. If you add new permanent members from other member states, from other world regions, well, would that solve any problems? Would that increase the buy-in from other states? Well, who knows? But I would certainly argue that that question is asked too little in the process. What exactly are we trying to achieve here? Say we have put one of these reform proposals in place. What do we think is going to happen? Now, there have been a couple of other reform efforts that go uh, beyond Security Council reform, and I just want to tackle these kind of briefly uh, to show you that there's other things going on, of course, in the UN. Some of these were driven by the uh, report by Kofi Annan. Some of them came out of other reform discussions. So we had in 2006 a high-level panel on system-wide coherence. Um, so the idea here was that there, the coherence of delivery of the UN's mission should be improved. So um, how can the coordination between different agencies that are involved in the same issue area be improved, for example, in terms of humanitarian assistance in the environment and in development? Uh, in, 2020, we had, in 2010, we had a couple of reforms all over the system. Maybe the most consequential one uh, was the formation of UN Women. Uh, you see the administrator of UN Women here, Pumzele Mlambo and Nuka, um, who leads UN Women which is the UN's own body to foster gender equality, both inside and outside the UN. But overall, these were sort of watered down from the original uh, um, change proposals. 2011, we had a number of, event, uh, of attempts at streamlining institutional processes, partly driven by looking at where this system-wide coherence project had come uh, that was started in 2006. Uh, in 2014, we had the so-called Fit for Purpose initiative that asked whether the UN's structure and processes were fit for purpose. In this particular uh, instance, uh, fit for delivering uh, on, in, on fostering development. And then in 2015, uh, the UNGA 70 uh, initiative was started that was designed to revitalize the General Assembly, tackle the issue of Security Council reform, uh, once more, which of course led us back to the situation that we just talked about just a slide ago, where all the discussions about UN reform inevitably collapse into Security Council reform.
Okay, thank you, Pass Patrick, for that wonderful overview. Very well done. Great job. Okay, so we've seen that the UN has undergone some major, some not so major reforms over time. We've also heard that there's a lot of different models that are competing for the world's attention and for the attention of the states that make up the UN. So then fundamentally, the question does become, um, is the UN still fit for purpose? We've heard that there's a whole initiative there in 2014 that asked this question of the UN system, but in a sense, it's still exactly the kind of question that we need to ask because you know, in the face of things like civil wars, um, famines and underdevelopment, in the face of climate change and global pollution, in the face of terrorism and security threats, is the UN truly still the organization to look for to tackle and solve all, this problem, all these problems? Is it still fit for the purposes that it was created for more than three quarters of a century ago? So um, the UN itself has acknowledged this, of course, and it's started this um, uh, exercise, you could call it, called UN 75 um, last year. Uh, 2020 and beyond was the tagline and was essentially a kind of a global listening project. So the UN was trying to solicit um, feedback um, from individuals from all over the world as to how it could be made better. Um, funnily enough, last year we had a little live stream on this and uh, one of the students worked with the UN 75 project and recorded the live stream and then sent our discussion and suggestions to the UN. Don't know what became of it. Obviously, this was intended to be a slightly bigger, more involved process, uh, the UN 75. But 2020, of course, threw a, a, a wrench in the, a spanner in the works. So um, they couldn't really have the widespread global consultations that were planned. But the initiative keeps going on. So let me get on my soapbox for a second. Um, let me tell you what I think um, the, the UN system could or maybe should do. So first off, and maybe this is slightly counterintuitive, I think at this point, fundamental structural reforms are basically impossible. They are dead on arrival whenever we discuss them, and they won't happen. So whatever hasn't been reformed in 76 years of the UN existing is unlikely to be reformed in the coming 76 years. That's not rocket science. You know, the reasons for this are pretty well known, and they've been the same reasons for many decades now. The general reluctance of states to transfer sovereignty to the UN isn't changing. So giving any particular part of its structure more competences is probably not going to happen because there's always enough states that worry about take giving away their sovereignty to a global organization. There's also, of course, the P5, the veto powers and the Security Council that are extremely reluctant to reduce their own weight whether they are still global superpowers or not, looking at you, Britain, um, they still have very few incentives to change uh, a, a structure that advantages them in such a significant way. So they lack both the incentives and the political will, given that there is such, just so little to be gained for them from fundamental structural reforms. So things like, you know, do away with the Security Council or... Um, make Security Council votes depend on General Assembly consent or something. Those things are, are dead on arrival and they're basically, um, they're not worth our time, I would argue. Comparing this to the EU, which is sometimes done to drive home the point that there are certain international organizations where states are willing to give up sovereignty, I think such comparisons are unhelpful because fundamentally, you know, there's a fairly clear regional identity, much more clear than a global identity could be in terms of a global organization like the UN. And more importantly, there is a much greater congruence between the rule makers and the rule takers in the EU because the group of states that make the rules inside the EU it's a much more focused group that are much more aligned in their interests and where it's much more likely that any rules that are taken are also being accepted by everyone in the organization. I also think as a second point that discussions about structural reforms are not just pointless, so they're not just a waste of time, but I also think they are actively um, a hindrance to 
actual conversations about UN reform. So um, we can talk a lot actually about how the UN could and should operate without always coming back to fundamental structural reforms, which I think never goes anywhere. So just saying, you know, we can't solve the Security Council dilemma, so let's just not talk about UN reform, I think that's not good enough. So all the debates keep circling back to this idea of structural reforms, and that means that uh, other types of reforms always frame this being of secondary importance, and I think that's, um, that's not the right mindset to have, that's not the right approach to take. And I mean, even if we do accept that structural reforms are needed, these are not, this is not mutually exclusive with improvements elsewhere. So we can say, yes, there should be structural reforms, but that doesn't mean that we can't improve the UN in other ways. It's a bit like if you stop cleaning the kitchen just because your roof is leaky. Like you can be concerned about one problem, but still get going on another problem. So we should basically just accept that, the, that how the UN looks today is how it looks fundamentally, structurally, and just get on with it basically. Worry about other things, tackle more tangible things that also have an impact on problem solving. So I think we have to combat the perception that making the UN more efficient and more effective on an operational level is somehow of secondary importance. You know, we can make the UN better while still striving and fighting for uh, structural change. And it does seem that the UN is gradually realizing this too, because most of the changes that the UN has made have been at the margins. They've been at, you know, creating the odd additional agency that is more specialized in its issue area. It's been to, you know, streamline certain processes to rethink parts of its bureaucracy and other things. So this will also allow the people that work for the UN, which one the is probably going to include one or a few of you that are listening now, um, it's going to give them a better environment to succeed in. And I think the, the key part to understanding what I'm suggesting here, the kind of reforms that we're focusing on, that we should, should be focusing on, is that the UN is a bureaucracy first and foremost. The UN is fundamentally not all that different from like a big city administration with a mayor at the top who is the secretary general. And then there's a whole structure, a pyramid of hierarchies underneath that where everything is a very defined process. So, um, and I think why that's the key is that there's also specific ways in which you can reform bureaucracies in which, in which you can change bureaucracies to make things work better. And we know this because it's worked on other levels and it's worked domestically, so why wouldn't it work for a global organization? So I think I have sort of three main proposals that if I was Secretary General, I would enact in my first year. Um, so the first one would be that the bureaucratic structures inside the UN have to be re rethought. They have to be reworked. One of the famous ways to describe UN decision making is that process beats results. So the UN is very much predicated on this notion that because the correct process has been followed, the result must therefore be adequate. And this is something that you actually see in lots of kind of big bureaucracies and organizations that are fundamentally kind of conservative. I don't mean politically conservative, but I mean conservative in terms of that everyone likes to minimize their own responsibility for the process, but they do like sticking to the rules because that means that they have a minimum amount of culpability in case anything goes wrong. And this idea is very kind of widespread in UN negotiations, that process beats results. As long as everyone has been consulted and there's been things being sent back and forth, then we can also assume that the end result is a good one. And this often leads to turf wars between different organizations, for example, if the same issue is being worked by worked on by different UN agencies, and that's a big problem. There is tons of red tape inside the UN, tons of forms that have to be filled out 16 times. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling that number out of my ass just a tiny bit, but still, you know, I mean, flatten the hierarchies, introduce some positions with a wider focus and don't structure everything in this uh, pyramid shaped, strictly hierarchical way that it is currently. And there's been some reforms done actually in the past couple of years that have addressed this. And of course, while we're at it, by the way, while we're rethinking these uh, bureaucratic procedures, let's also think a little bit about gender parity across the board. 
Women are still much overrepresented at the lowest pay grades uh, inside the UN, but very underrepresented at the higher pay grades. And that includes, of course, the most prestigious position, which is the Secretary General ship, which still hasn't been held by women in 76 years, which is ridiculous at this point. So rethink your bureaucratic structures, rethink the notion of process beating results and try to um, uh, try to make sure that the results come first. And if that means that the process can't be followed entirely, maybe that's the way to, to go. The second bit is overhaul processes. So the UN has um, a lot of redundancies. And by redundancies, I don't mean this in like a, uh, you know, KPMG kind of McKinsey sort of way, like it eliminate a couple of people because we're not entirely sure what they're doing. It's just the fact that if you look at the organizational chart of the UN, you will see that lots and lots of organizations and agencies are effectively all often doing the same things. And that leads to redundancies, not only because several people are working on it, but also because several agencies might take different decisions and set different priorities. And that leads to a ton of confusion, uh, to a ton of confusion. Additionally, there's redundancies between the UN system and organizations outside of the UN system. The UN, of course, in almost every issue area, maybe besides peace and security, isn't the only organization around that deals with that issue. You know, there's tons of environmental, uh, global environmental organizations. There's lots and lots of organizations that deal with human rights. There's tons of um, uh, development uh, agencies and uh, organizations dealing with development aid. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of uh, overlap both inside the UN and between the UN and the outside that isn't always helpful because you know more people working on a project doesn't necessarily mean that you have better results um, and I think especially in the case of an overlap between the UN and outside organizations that are doing essentially the same job I think that should be the first thing we look to when we uh, eliminate these redundancies I'm just going to quote one of my fa favorite examples here from the from the left and it is a little bit of a curvature of bananas type example, but I still, still think it's illustrative of a deeper point here. So in 2008, Bolivia asked the UN for a list of standards for llama and alpaca meat. Okay, Bolivia both consumes llama and alpaca meat and also exports uh, a bit of it. So they pitched this to the UN and the UN tasked the UN Economic Commission for Europe with producing a guide the UN Economic Commission for Europe, which I'm not entirely sure why that was working for Bolivia, but anyway, they produced a 44 page guide that dealt with fat thickness, with trimming, with how ragged the edges were supposed to be of the meat, like all kinds of stuff. And if you look at what the UN Commission for Europe is doing, it's doing mostly these kind of things with 220 people and a $50 million budget. Now, mind you, I'm not doing this like Farage style, like, ha ha ha, look at how silly the UN is. What I'm saying is there's a lot of people that are working on this and this type of work could potentially be done much more, much better and more efficiently outside of the UN. There's no reason why this has to be dealt with by the UN. I mean, there's a massive overlap with the WHO, with the World Health Organization, in terms of food safety standards, with the Food and Agricultural Organization, with the EU's Food Safety Authority, with the WTO, if you're worried about the trade of this kind of meat, and of course, with the FDA, um, the Food and Drug Administration in the US. So all of these organizations come up with their own sets of standards. So why does the UN necessarily need to wade in there with $50 million budgets and 200 people that are working on these types of things? That might conceivably be solved better elsewhere. Concentrate the UN on the things that matter. And then lastly, I think the, the last point that won't set the world on fire really is point three here. I think finance reform is really important for the UN. The UN budget is famously opaque and intransparent. It's actually really hard to find really good numbers on many aspects of the budget. Um, in different publications, the UN's budget, yearly budget, is given anywhere between five and twenty billion dollars, depending on how we count things. There shouldn't be this much of a span. We should be pretty sure of, of how much money is flowing around the system. And um, I think it makes sense, for example, to use outside auditing to, to uh, audit the, the finances of these countries and um, 
uh, actually follow up on the suggestions made by these outside auditors. I would also argue that staff quality is sometimes not great at the UN. I think it would make more sense to have fewer staff working in a higher quality of jobs with higher quality equipment and infrastructure. Um, I think that just makes more sense for an organization. And um, I don't know if you know this, but the majority of contracts at the UN are very short. The majority of UN contracts are three to six months. And remember that what you're looking for here is some of the um, smartest and brightest people from around the world that are still willing to uproot themselves, go to New York for contracts, but they're only ever um, secure for six months at a time. That's not the way to structure a workforce and that's not a structure to have the most important organization of the world um, be staffed. So look, none of these suggestions, you know, rethink your bureaucratic structures, overhaul the processes and eliminate redundancies and conduct some finance reform. None of these will set the world on fire, okay? But I do think they will make the UN work better and that might in turn increase state buy-in. You know, one of the criticisms that's so often labeled at the UN, uh, leveled at the UN is that it is just inefficient. Like it's, it should be better at its job at, at, uh, at managing the organization itself and at delivering results for its states. And I don't think we can just say that states should be, should stop being big babies and just get on with it because it is a big organization, you know, it does cost a lot of money. So, um, we need to make sure that it is above reproach in how it conducts itself. And in the past, it hasn't been that. So um, I think in terms of UN reform, I think think small and do the doable make more sense than attempting these giant structural reforms that always go nowhere and then we end up not discussing anything else. Okay, that was my very long soapbox. So let's sum up where we are here. As a conclusion, you know, the UN is such a fascinating organization because it is so many things to so many people. Um, the span of debate and discussion uh, on the UN is is so large because the positions that people hold towards this global organization is so, you know, there's such, they're between such extremes. So, you know, you have on the one hand people that are genuinely worried, I'm assuming genuinely worried, that this is an overreaching organization, that you, for most things, don't need a global organization um, whose main goal its critics could say, is eliminating state sovereignty. You know, the main goal of having something like the UN is that decisions are taken at the global level rather than at the national level. And doesn't that take away power from those very institutions that we as citizens are most involved in voting for and electing? Then, of course, you know, the, the spectrum goes on over the UN being just a convenient forum for negotiation. So, you know, this is not quite the overreaching organization view where you're worried that the black UN helicopters are coming in and making you do things. Um, but basically just saying, you know, the UN is a convenient forum. It's not much more than that. It's just a nice way of states to get together and it's more efficient than, you know, meeting on an ad hoc basis. But then it's also, you know, this maddeningly complex bureaucracy and this hierarchy. I mean, I've showed you on the previous slide or I told you, I told you on the previous slide, um, that this bureaucracy is one of the major impeding factors for it being more efficient. And if you remember from the first UN lecture, the UN, like this structural graph of how the UN is structured, it looks ridiculous because there's too much going on. Oftentimes you hear critics also just say that this is an expensive talking shop. It's basically just a way to once a year get world leaders into a place, have some handshakes, take some photos, and then go apart without ever really achieving very much. Um, now, if you are more positive towards the UN, you could at the very least, I think, point to it being an agenda setter and a norm entrepreneur. And I think even the critics would probably argue that it is not without consequence. If you have a very active sector general, if you have, you know, some active councils and forums that are good at PR and good at getting the word out and good at framing the discussion, I think in those instances, the UN can achieve quite a lot. And the UN can especially drive the global conversation around certain topics in very significant ways um, that I think even the critics wouldn't say don't exist. I, a friend of mine who works for the German Foreign Service once called the UN um, the best people in the worst structures. Um, you know, it goes back to my previous slide, but it's... Um, 
it, it, I think it's the view that most people that work for the UN would probably subscribe to. Um, but a little bit of what's interesting about the EU is that in a sense, all of these different conceptions, you know, the bad structure, the overreach, the forum, the bureaucracy, but also the norms, the dynamism, the drive, the framing, all of these are kind of true at the same time. And that's what makes it such a fascinating um, case study of international cooperation. So I think if we really want to sum up kind of what the UN has been and what it can be, you know, we probably say, you know, progress has been achieved but much remains out of reach. So we've gotten somewhere, but we're probably not there yet. Normally what I throw in whenever I want to derail a conversation about the UN is the very simple question of, you know, what else would we do? If the UN isn't it, if we don't think that the UN is really achieving much, how else would we structure things? You know, would we fall back on regional organizations completely? That's, you know, the world split up again, basically, into continents or sub-regions that all deal with their own problems and find their own um, ways of cooperating. Like, what would we replace it with? Um, we tried with the League of Nations, and what replaced it was the UN, which was much the same. So if we now try to replace the UN, what else would we come up with? And how would we ensure that states buy in? Again... A fascinating case study. I love the UN for all its like complexities, for all its frustrations, but also for all its promise. So, and I hope that I've uh, gotten that across to you in the past couple of lectures. Okay, the very last things. Um, Logistics-wise, the last regular live stream is this Friday, so it's the 26th of November. Um, we'll talk about the last two UN topics, and I'll reserve a little bit of time uh, for any exam questions that you might have. But really, mainly, you should take those to your last tutorials. They are designed to uh, coach you up a little bit on how the exam works. I did upload a video on exam tips um, last Friday, so please do have a look at that. It's in the assessment tab on Learn, and I'm showing you a little bit what I think, how you can approach uh, the questions, the types of questions that we're asking you. The course evaluation should be live by the time you see this video. Now, please do fill this out. I would love to hear your feedback. Those that have been on the live streams know that ICEP is actually going away. This is the very last year that ICEP has run, so you guys were the last ones to enjoy it. But that doesn't mean that the feedback wouldn't still be helpful. And, you know, any course that I um, lead and convene in the future, I would certainly benefit from knowing your thoughts as to what went well and what didn't. And lastly, uh, what remains to say is thank you from me. You've been great. You've been very patient. I haven't seen you all that much besides in the live streams, but at least from the interactions that I got there and the interactions I got via email and the few of you that I saw on the side, I've got nothing but positive things about you to say. So good luck for the rest of the semester. If you are uh, on any degree that has comparative politics in semester two as a compulsory, you will see me again because that's the next course I convene. But anyway, uh, good luck in the exam. Uh, have a wonderful Christmas break, and I will see you again next year. And to stop off, um, you know, nothing is uh, no uh, good uh, ICEP lecture is complete without hashtag pet content. So you see my three boys here. Uh, you see uh, my little boy Jackie on the left, the, the white little chihuahua. You see my boy Rudy in the middle, and then the wonderful Jules in his characteristic position on the right here, my desk cat and desk buddy. Thanks so much for your attention. I will see you again soon. Otherwise, good luck and um, see you then.